What's good, party people? This is According to Woods, and I have the honor and privilege of talking to my friend. He is one of the most enigmatic, innovative stars in professional wrestling today. He is the Price City OG. He is Alec Price. Alec, what's going on? Yo, what's good, dog? Thank you for having me on. This is, this well, is awesome. I love being on podcasts and everything, bro. Like, thank you. Well, I, I love that you you do these things because again as in innovative as you are in your arsenal you know so there are some guys that and girls that might you know turn on a little bit of the athletics because maybe the entertainment aspect isn't there yeah uh, you're not that guy you're no. somebody that is you know flashy as hell but also hard hitting as hell in the ring but then you i've seen your promos you're fucking good bro <laughs> thank you bro yeah, you know, I, I feel like, because, um, you know, a lot of people get lost in wrestling where they feel like it's just spots. Uh, that's what I feel like a lot of it, like, now, like, nowadays with the new age, it's just spots to them. And, like, it's not about the spots. Like, the whole art of wrestling is a story. It's it's not just it's not just about, you know, getting cool moves in and looking dope. It's about, you know, telling that story and letting the fans, you know, come. Like, there's a reason why the fans pay to see us. They want to see wrestling they want to see that story of a good guy and a bad guy someone who's uh, you know a piece of crap and someone who's like a great you know big baby that they want to see win and you know what i mean like this is it's not moves it's it, if it's it's not wrestling if you're just doing spots and moves in my opinion like you can do spots and all that but if you're not working then you're not you're not wrestling i i know you're you're speaking to me because there are a it, there's a new generation of wrestlers that you know. It, it's almost like they lose the will to win. One of the one of my favorite eu euphemisms that I saw when I was growing up, right? Or girl monsoon would literally go like, "Oh, you know, if a person won, he'd be like, he's going to the pay window." Or if a person lost, you know, like in an enhancement talent match or whatever, oh, it looks like uh, you know he's not going to the pay window, right? Yeah. Like. The, the fact that there was a will to win, that there are real stakes, right? Even if mm -hmm. it's not a title match or a blood feud, right? Yeah. Like this person, it put in your head, that if this person doesn't win, they don't get the money, right? And that's easy to understand. That's yeah. super, right? And that's one thing that is lost. Like, you know, they want to get your shit in, kid, right? You know, almost like a lucha style. You get all yeah. your shit in, even if it's a three-minute match with, uh, you know, with, with entrances and whatever. You try to get all of it in, but the story is lacking. And that's something that, I mean, I feel like you do impeccably well, or it's, you know, and you're so young in your career too. And it's, it's, it's like you're a tenured young vet. Like you've definitely, you know, stood in the, I guess the, the, under the influence of giants, right? Like great legends of the past where, where it's led to this presentation. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I was trained very old school. I was originally trained out of the Bell Time Club in Wakefield, Massachusetts, under the uh, the training of Bo Douglas uh, and Benny Duck and Benny Jooks, or Toto Loco, as some people may know him. Yeah. Um, Bo Douglas was trained by Killer Kowalski. Benny mm -hmm. Jooks was trained by Richard Burns and Tony Roy, who was also trained. Tony Roy was trained by Killer too. Mm. Um, I was just trained very old school. I was trained like I didn't get trained psychology until I was like six months to a year in because they wanted to make sure that I was gonna stick around and actually be with this business and that's what like i feel like it's not that wrestling isn't for everyone wrestling is for everyone everybody can be a part of wrestling and like i said a part of wrestling there's some people that are wrestlers there's some people that are refs there's some people that have to be managers there's some people that are announcers or commentators or and there's some people that need to be fans you know mm -hmm. what i mean but I feel like because, you know, I was I was trained by Bo and Benny, you know, it was a mix of uh, old school and new school. So I was I was definitely able to get that, like the dope old school aspect of Bo and all the cool, like old school stuff and like the like the marketing and networking. And then out of Benny, I got all the new cool in, like innovative new age stuff that like you wouldn't you wouldn't see because, you know, Benny and like Bo really know what they're doing. Now, you know, I train at Chaotic Wrestling and Bell Time Club. I'm doing both. I'm well. It's uh, it's yeah, chaotic wrestling, yeah, chaotic wrestling and belt time club. I'm doing both of them right now, so I'm just working my butt off. But yeah, no, I just like I said, wrestling is a story. Um, it's all about what you do. Like it's all about that. Like what? Why are we here? 
Like, what are we doing? And like, every time I go out there, I want to have a great fucking match. I, I, I don't mean to swear, but like, I want to yeah. have a banger. I want to have the best match I can possibly have. I'm going out there not to have the bet. Like I, I can have a match of the night anytime I want to. I'm going out there to have the best match for my spot on the card. I'm not trying to make the person behind me look bad. I'm trying to make them work harder. Mm -hmm. You could have a three minute match and not get your stuff in because like, like, uh, like Perry, like when I went to a Perry Saturn seminar, Perry Saturn said to me, he was like, less is more is an, is an old thing that old timers say, cause they don't want to work. You can get more out of less. No, people don't get that. People don't get like, you can do the simplest stuff and the crowd will pop because it's, you're getting more like the moments and everything in that story matters. You could do a dragon screw, but if it makes sense and you've been working and destroying that guy's leg, the minute you hit that dragon screw, people are going to be like, Oh my God, like mm -hmm. he's destroying that leg. You know what I mean? Like, so, but I mean, I've definitely, I like for the first year and a half of the, my career, I was able to, you know, pay my dues and go on the road. That's why a lot of people in New England didn't really know me like that. Yeah. I definitely worked one place up here. I went with Big Time Wrestling. I was going up and down the East Coast, South Carolina, Tennessee, North Carolina, Maryland, um, Pennsylvania, New York. I was going up and down. Um, I actually ended up getting my South Carolina license. I got to meet a lot of cool lessons like uh, Shane Douglas and the Sandman and, um, you know, like, uh, who else? The Rock and Roll Express. I met, like, I met all these different people and it's not me being like, I met them. It's like, no, I was able to sit there and like, just listen under their learning tree and be able to like do what wrestlers should do. And that's pay their dues and like, l listen, like shut their mouths and listen. Like there's a reason why they've been in the business for years. You know what I mean? Like they obviously mm -hmm. know something that kept them in this business. So I just wanted to, you know, that's just how I've always grown, you know, grown up that old school way. Well, that's, I mean, you're mentioning, you know, places like Chaotic where you're training now, uh, I mean, on the, the Eastern Seaboard, but I think the world over have sent, you know, guys and girls to the WWE, AEW, like, there's a lot of Chaotic, especially, I mean, I, I remember, you know, what, reading the PWI 500, right, and, like, they're like almost the first blurb of a chaotic trainee that had made it. It was like, oh, also a chaotic standout and what have you. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, so that's, I mean, that is. Well, that's I train at both Bell Time and Chaotic. Because, that's dope. Because Bell Time's my home. And um, I, I, I wouldn't be anywhere without Bell Time. I wouldn't be the wrestler I am. If, and it's not me dissing any other school. I just right. feel like if I went anywhere else, I wouldn't be who I was in the ring today. Like Bell Time was the perfect place for me to learn and get better and be able to like hone my craft and like do what I have to do. So, That's... but the, the chaotic's great. I love training under. Yeah. I love training under Chase and Smashmaster. They're really good trainers. Like I like the dynamic there. Yeah. it's a cool place. Like I learn a lot at Chaotic and I learn. I learned a bunch at Bell Time. So, that's pretty damn sick. Which. Before we get too quickly, uh, I mean, I mean, too far along in the story, but uh, I mean, every hero has an origin story, right? So, like, how did you, even before the training and what have you, what made you want to become a pro wrestler? Or, I mean, when did you first discover pro wrestling? Um, I first discovered pro wrestling when I was a kid. My Nana was the hugest, biggest wrestling fan there was. She was the other person in the family that loved wrestling as much as I did, like as much as I did. Um, my Nana loved the Von Erichs. She was a big Von Erichs fan. Loved Carrie, the Texas Tornado. Mm -hmm. like, she she loved them. Like when she watched wrestling, the whole block watched wrestling because she was screaming, "Rip his head off, kill him!" Like she was into it. So like the earliest memories I have, like of me being a little baby and me being an infant, was sitting in front of the TV with my brothers and my Nana watching wrestling. Um, eventually, like after a while, you know, my Nana passed away, you know, God rest her soul. And, um, my brothers and them kind of started coming off wrestling because of where I grew up, you know, wrestling wasn't the most popular, um, for a reason. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in the hood with all my, so my brothers, like they weaned off of it. I kind of started to get away from it. I still loved it. I've always loved it, but I started to, cause there was nobody else that loved it as much as I did. Right. There was nobody like my Nana that I was able to share with it and be able to like, be like, talk with it about it. Like everybody else I talked to didn't want to listen to it. Oh, that's fake. That's stupid. Nah, bro. Like this is my, this is what I want to do. And um, I found my best friend, Eddie, me and my best friend, Eddie, like 
freaking we clicked like that he had all the, all the games all the belts all everything like he he loved wrestling as much as i did so i found my friend that was able to like he had all the video games like i was going over there like it it, it was life it was it, i found somebody in a re like re-sparked that passion in wrestling that i had now it was like i don't care what you guys think this is this is my love like this is what i like like it doesn't matter if you guys don't like wrestling it's what i care a fuck about it's about me yeah and um uh, my ex got my, I start my boy was in a backyard company. Um, it wasn't like a backyard wrestling company, like the ones that get rings and try to run shows and fans. Right. I have no respect for those yarders. Um, I'm talking about like, we were in my back friend. We were in my back, my, my boy's backyard with like wood freaking milk crates and mattresses yeah. on top of milk crates, you know, making a base and, you know, his grandma screaming over the freaking rail and being like, don't kill Spider-Man. Don't kill Spider-Man. No, no, no. Like it was, it was a fun time. Um, I did that for about a year. And then um, I, um, I, to be honest, I think I almost broke my neck during one of the matches. Um, some kid went to do a Canadian, but he wrapped wow. my legs like a code red. <gasps> and then he flipped. My head almost went straight through. Like, thank God the mattresses split. Yeah. You know, like where I hit was in between where the match, the two mattresses met. So they split open and my head went in and my shoulders like stopped me from cracking my head or like hurting myself. So after that, I decided that um, I want to do this. Like if I'm going to do this, I want to get trained. Like I don't want to get hurt in the backyard and be that bum that got hurt in backyard. No, I want to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to want to be trained and I want to do this. Like having that year of backyard kind of showed me what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then I found the bell time club. My mom was friends with Pat Dillon who had like an associate. He does uh, UFO wrestling. Yeah. He had a, like an association with the bell time club. Like he knows Bo and all them and they're very good. So, um, yeah, that story was it. I hit up Pat showed up the next day and just started, you know, started working my ass off. You know, at first they don't think people thought much of me and you know even going through my career a lot of people didn't think really much of me they thought i was just a skinny kid with an attitude that wasn't going to really make it anywhere or going to stay on the shindies and you know it's fine because if if it wasn't for that like i i proved all of them wrong and i'm continuing to prove people wrong so i i, I go in there and and i go on that ring I, I try to prove myself every every single time so that's my origin story i went to bell time club and then started wrestling so that's brilliant, and and the the fact that your kind of start, especially in the backyard, it's not too dissimilar from the Hardy Boys, or you know, and I mean that it's not just the Hardy Boys. Where Shannon Moore came out of there, uh, Gregory right. Helms, you know, and again, all innovators, right? Uh, and look no other than uh, you know a fellow Northeaster, uh, but Mick Foley, right? Yep. He, you know, and um, but the thing about it is the epiphany that you had, which that is going to serve you well in, in not just your career, but your life. You're like, Oh shit. I almost broke my neck like yes. this. So either, uh, you know, instead of just, you know, like for shits and giggles and, you know, for my friends and whatever, if I'm really going to be serious about this and, and this being my career, well, I can get hurt in here if I'm going to go there. Right. And that's, a that's a pretty intense for insight and foresight in your early young life, man. Like there's like most people would have kept on going. Most people no, would have kept it, on it's, it's just, you know, I'm very grateful for having the parents that I have. You know what I mean? They raised me to be an adult since I was a kid. And uh, you know, if it wasn't for them then like in a good way, but they you know, they raised me to be a man. They didn't raise any of us to be kids or to be like off of like living off of them for the rest of our lives and be spoiled. Like we were raised like there is a point where we're not going to be here and you guys are going to have to do this shit. So let's give you the tools now so you can progress and do what you have to do. So you're set. And, you know, I'm just, because of them, that's how I'm able to let you think the way I think sometimes. Ah, uh, shout out to moms and dads. And shout like, out to mom Dukes and, you know, Papa. You know, yeah. Big Papa. The grumpy that's, bastard. Yeah. You know, and again, you know, which I want to ask, like, because you were saying like your brothers are into it, then they weren't into it. You're in a neighborhood that, you know, maybe might not be conducive to pro wrestling watching. Right. Yeah, so, no, it was not. <laughs> right. So what does mom and pops think, you know, when, uh, when the, the, the soon to be Price city OG uh, says he wants to, you know, get it between this squared circle. 
Well, um, I mean, like, at first, like, I've always kind of said it, you know, since I was a kid, you know, my mom, you know, I've said to my mom before, if I was going to be an MMA fighter or a pro wrestler, which one would you want to be? She was like a pro wrestler because MMA fighters, they're really trying to punch you in the face, not knowing that when I go on to a match, I'm getting punched in the face anyways. Yes. But it's whatever. Um, but, you know, at first, you know, my mom and dad, like, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have started class because at that point, like, I hadn't, like, I was too, I, like, I got, I had a job, but I wasn't going to be able to pay for class like that because it was just yeah. way too expensive. And, like, they didn't have, like, you know, we never really grew up with money, so they didn't have money like that, but um when they figured out that i was really passionate about this like they seen me doing the backyards and they seen me like going every week and making sure that my shit like i had made my own gear i made every like i was full on like i was working two characters like and they seen my passion for it when they really seen that i wanted to do this like they weren't just gonna throw money that they could use on bills to something else or like to something that i'm just gonna stop in two weeks like they want to make sure that i actually do this so once they figured out that I wanted to do it, they were like totally ex like they loved it. They were accept like they they wanted me to do it and wanted anything that I'm gonna be happy with. Like if you're gonna be happy, that's all we want. Like if you feel like this is what you gotta do and you can do this and we we you know we raised you, you can do anything you want. Parnell's a succeeder, so do this shit. And they, you know, gave me the bread to start class, and then after that, I I paid. But you know, if they were really great. Like if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't have been able to get in when I got in. Like, um, they were very supportive of me and like, let me follow my dream and they're never overbearing. They're always there when I need them, but they always want to make sure that I'm good. Like everything's all set. So, which is uh, pretty, pretty awesome, you know? And for me, you know, pro wrestling is a combat sport. You, you know, you look at things like, you know, Josh Barnett's blood sport. You look at UWF, you oh, know, it's a combat sport. Yeah, it's 100%. a combat sport for it's sure. It's a combat sport. hundred percent. Right. So in, in that instance, right, where there's there's no prototype, there's no template uh, uh, for prototype. Shout out to another uh, <laughs> Massachusetts-based wrestler who might have gone into Hollywood. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, there are guys like, you know, Jamie Iovine, whose dad, Jimmy, you know, is like a mensch when it comes to you know, everything music, you know, was behind a lot of great bands and, you know, you know, help Dr. Dre kind of facilitate the, the Beats by Dre deal and sold to Apple for eons, right? So, you know, Jamie is involved in pro wrestling, right? And he, Silver Spoon in his mouth, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, there's MMA fighters that, you know, there's, uh, God, I can't, Jordan, I forget, he's in the UFC now, but he, he's, uh, I think it's Jordan Wright. And he calls himself the Beverly Hills Ninja. He literally trains just a stone's throw away from Beverly Hills and Brentwood, right? Pretty yeah. affluent places. But then there's salt of the earth guys and girls like you. Your your, your story isn't too di dissimilar than maybe a Mia Yim, who unfortunately just got released. But, you know, she was doing the same things here in like San Bernardino in California, mm -hmm. right? And it's just like there's no template to follow to be, become a, a – great pro wrestler there are people that might get the book that might you know get that rocket you know yeah. uh, put on their back right and they have never watched pro wrestling at all right yeah. just that is started out as a fitness model you know mm -hmm. uh you know the masterpiece you know chris adonis right or not or formerly chris masters you know he's a guy who maybe he knew how to wrestle but if he didn't they were still gonna sign that guy because look at how he looks even yeah. into his 40s right so yeah. you know there's no template you know it could be a move set it could be a match it could be a promo you know yeah. mostly his promos you know when he was in ccw blew me out like there was no doubt that he was going to be a big star somewhere when i was watching him you know in ccw doing promos because i was like who can touch this guy yeah who, no yeah, one exactly no um there, there's definitely no you know, template, like everyone's roads different. Nobody has the same road. Um, and I feel like some people like get lost in that aspect because a lot of people are like, well, they're getting signed. Why am I not signed? Like just because it hasn't happened for you, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen down the line. Like that's why it's like, people ask me, why haven't you been on TV? It's like, it's going to happen. I'm going to mm -hmm. have my bangers. I'm going to do what I have to do and I'm going to continue to progress and when it happens, it happens. And when it happens, I'm going to take that opportunity to make the best of it. Um, and, you know, like you said, like, there's no template. Like, just p 
people who are themselves like when I go out there, I'm not a character. Like there's no difference between Alec Price and Alec. I'm not giving my shoot last name. Right, of but, course. You know what I mean? But like, there's a difference. Like, the, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm myself time ten when I'm in my ring. Like, I'm still a cocky, you know, loud mouth, you know, ballsy loud mouth with a death wish in real life. But I'm not that like you, you know you know what I'm saying? Like the best wrestlers make make like they're themselves times ten. Their moves are what like it's unique to them. The way they move in the ring, the way their facials, the way they react, everything is them. And like, I feel like 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 I said, like there's people that get signed right off the gate from being like having a great look. Mm-hmm. Like you know, wrestling is a cosmetic business. It's definitely gotten better, but it still is at the end of the day a cosmetic business. Like mm-hmm. I may not be six, I may not be six seven, you know, three hundred pounds, but I'm six, you know, six feet, you know, hundred and seventy pounds now. But I'm still, I'm still showing, like I'm still laying it in and showing it that I can do it. Like, mm-hmm. I like when people go out there, they believe that it's like it's not even about like if you're big now. It's about can you fuck, can you fight me? Like, can you can you beat me up? Can you fuck me up? If I was to see you, would you give me the hands? Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and that's that's like that's you know when I go out there, I feel like you know people look at me at first like who's this kid, but when they see me actually doing my stuff, they're like holy crap, I don't want to mess with him. So like yeah, that's just that's just how it is. Like if you look like you can beat somebody up, you can be yes. a pro wrestler. It doesn't mean you're gonna be the greatest pro wrestler, right? But you can be a pro wrestler, and everybody can do their own things their own way. And even if it's like small move sets, they'll be able to have a couple moves and have a banger of a match and do nothing. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, hundred percent. Especially like you know, like. There was there was a little bit of a tidbit that like you know honky tonk man hasn't worked I mean hasn't taken a bump you know since what 1998 which is like the last time he was in WCW right so theoretically speaking that's not to say honky tonk man isn't getting booked you know yeah no. everywhere right like yeah. and still working matches but he figured out a way. It's like not, nope, not nope, because mm, I, I gotta I gotta live I have to have a quality of life. Once the fans go away, once the you know the gimmicks are sold, I still got to go back to the wife and kids and be a semblance of a human being. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which I mean, speaking of you know like different roads, right? So, how long did you spend at Bell Time? At, you know, before you started getting booked elsewhere? What was like the correct? I mean, not to get too into the weeds, you know, uh, obviously contact bell time if you want to get more information on the school and their training. Right. But, uh, you know, like how long did you spend, you know, basically cultivating your foundation I've to where you were booking? I've been at bell time my whole career. It's hitting five years in February. Um, when I started training when I was 18, um, I've always been at Bell Time. Bell Time will always be my home, um, cause it's just that's my that's my spot. Like I love that spot to death. I would like I said I wouldn't be anywhere without Bell Time. It's just it's just good. Like, but I mean I like I said for I I, got, I was working at like one spot in Rhode Island. Um, my first like I, like I, I had my first match, my first rumble at three months, my first singles against my trainer at six months. And then, like, after that, that's when I started getting booked to, like, one other place, which was, like, a little shindy in Rhode Island. Um, but, I mean, you know, they gave me the opportunity. I'm not going to disrespect them. Like, they, right. they gave me a shot when nobody else was giving me a shot. So, right. you know, so, hats off to you guys. Thank you for giving me that opportunity, if, you know, booking me on your show and no one else did. Um, but I was work- I went on the road for a year and a half traveling with my trainer over Big Time Wrestling. Um, I was still working that one spot with Showcase, but that's why, like, not a, not a lot of people around here, like, when people figure out that I'm I'm gonna hit five years, they're like, "Wait, you've been in the you've been wrestling for five years now?" And it's like, "Yeah," and they're like, "I thought you were wrestling for like two or like three, maybe like the most three. I'm like, "No, like, I, like first year and a half, I paid dues. I went on the road, and then um, I was I got booked on uh, Let's Wrestle up here. Um, you know, the sister company to Limitless. Yeah, yeah. Got booked for a Rumble, and you know. I, you know, I went in there and, you know, even though some people didn't think much of me at the time, you know, they grew, they grew to know that I was here to do it. And every time I came back, I was passionate and I, I paid my dues, you know, I made sure that I took care, like I helped with the ring, I helped with the show, like, and when I had matches, I always got better and always took my opportunities. So 
it, it was definitely like after I think after a year and a half like it was like probably two years in when I started getting more places about like three when I started like really getting booked on like big shows like Limitless that's incredible and you know obviously you know your ethos right your mindset now is to have the best match of you know where you are in the card but you know, as you're kind of, you know, formulating your move set and your ideology about the biz, like what is, you know, as somebody that is just starting out, and luckily you had your trainer not too far away, mm -hmm. but like, what was your, your kind of mindset? Was it just to get book and get this experience that you needed? Because there, and, and there isn't a lot that you can showcase in a battle Royal. Right. Yeah. And especially when the move set might not be as, you know, kind of compiled as it would be later, right? Yeah. So what was your kind of, you know, ideology getting booked on the shows? What did you want to show the promoters or the fans of a particular area? Um, Like now, you you know, but like back in the day, my mindset when I was greener, like it was obviously to get booked places. Like I've always had the idea in my mind where I wanted to get signed. So anything that I can do that's going to get me further or get me closer to that, that's what I've always done. Like when I was a greenhorn, I wanted to get on shows because I know if I start to get on shows, I'll start getting used to the crowd and be able to start having matches not in front of, you know, classmates because class class matches easy as crap because you rest, you train with those people like yeah. they've seen you mess up, but you go in front of a crowd, they don't know you. So they will be brutally honest with you. So it's like I wanted to start getting booked on shows to get me better so I could start being get better at crowd work and start, you know, honing my craft. And then after I started getting booked places, I was like, all right, now I want to start getting booked at, you know, really good places so I can face better people to get better and progress. And mm -hmm. then it was just continuously like that. It was always about one goal. And that's, you know, making this my life. Like I want to do this for the rest of my life. Like I'm not one of those guys that just say it because it's just to be like, no, I really want to do this. Like, this is all I have. When wrestling was gone during the pandemic, I was doing crazy shit. Like I did not know what to do. Like I was back in like back, like it, it was just not good stuff. You know what I mean? Like not like in bad ways, but like I was just doing stuff that would have, would have messed my whole career up because I wasn't, I didn't have wrestling there. If that makes sense. Like wrestling yeah. saved my, me like, I don't yes. know where I would be. I would probably be on a corner right now with like, with you know what I mean, with a group of dudes. Like if it wasn't yeah. for wrestling, if that you know what I mean, like yeah, and like legit, like I I fucking love wrestling, and like this legit saved my fucking life. So this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, and that's why it's like when I go out there, I want to have bangers. It's all about having the best match I can have. If I'm not going out there having the quality match I know I can have as a professional as a man, then I don't want to do it. Like. That's just it. Like, if I can't go out there and give it my all, why the fuck? Why am I even doing this? Right. So every match, I'm gonna have a banger. I'm gonna give it my all. I'm gonna make sure that everyone knows who I am because it's it's not it's not about me at the end of the day. It's about my career and mm -hmm. me making this my profession and me, you know, me progressing and showing why I feel like I am not not throwing shade or anything, but I am the future of professional wrestling. Yes. Like, I'm not I'm not not getting too cocky. You know what I mean? Like anything like that. Like I feel like I am the future of professional wrestling, and you know there's a lot of great people now. But I feel like you know once I get re once I get to a certain point and I get to that certain level, there's nothing that's gonna stop me. No, and I I love that ideology, and I I don't think for me it's not it's not cocky, right? And because like you were saying, you know, and there are many other you know, combat sports athletes that have said it, you know, mixed martial artists, Muay Thai fighters, jiu-jitsu, catch wrestlers that have said the same thing. If not for this sport, you know, I don't know where I would be, you know, there, and there are people that maybe have never trained in any other sport or done any other sport or people that, you know, maybe have bad knees from football or basketball and know that they're not getting you know, division one or NBA or even, you know, NBA, NFL, Europe deal, right? And they go into pro wrestling or mixed martial arts or something like that. And it's just like, it, it's a second wave of their life. It's a, re, a rebirth, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and the fact that you have put so much into this, right? You know, walking, you know, the times that you and Eddie, you know, when it wasn't a Vogue, you know, to be watching wrestling, you were doing all of it. 
you know, when you were doing the backyard stuff and you almost broke your fucking neck. Like, that stuff. You know, all of the bumps and the... Like, something as, at least to the optics, as a wrestling fan, as running the ropes. If you don't hit the ropes right, that could be a, a damn lynching. Yeah. You know? And that's why I feel like you, you should be a little bit more boisterous because you have you know, pay the dues and still continuing to pay the dues. And if you didn't want to get to the, the highest, dues. right. If you don't want to get to the highest where your craft can get to, why are you even doing it? Do the miles mean anything? Do the bumps, do the, the, the sore injuries. Does it mean anything if it, if you're not wanting to test yourself against the best of the best? Facts. That's true. That's yeah. 100%. So do you have a, like a, a, up to your your career this thus far, do you have like a favorite match or arena? Um, I I mean I like the um, I never got to wrestle in it, but that's because it's just like big times with the pandemic and stuff. But uh, right. the Altoona show that the big time wrestling used to run in, like it was a beautiful arena. Um, it used to be like a mosque that they like wow. did into an arena and has a gorgeous ceiling and. It's it's beautiful. Um, there's a I mean, there's a lot of places. I have a lot of great, like a lot of favorite matches. I know, like me versus Eddie Edwards um, on Thin Ice. You know, one of my favorite matches to date, and that's just because, like, like even the one with Josh Alexander. That's like mm -hmm. a, that's one. Like I fucking love that match because you know I learned so much from that match, and I was you know able to you know you know sit under his tree and like just have it you know under his learning tree and have a banger have a banger and like just be able to be in there with an international superstar. And with Eddie mm -hmm. Edwards, it was the same. Like it, it was one of my favorite matches because I got to wrestle like one of the guys that I grew up watching. Yeah. To wrestle somebody that was a, a fellow Kowalski. Yes. Like, he was trained by killer. I was grandfathered in because of mm -hmm. my trainers. Like it meant so much to me having that match. Um, other matches, you know, like anything that I've done with Ace Romero. I, I love those matches because we beat the crap out of each other. That's my older brother. Like, you know, he really, you know, helped me, like, get into the mindset of trying to get, you know, he really started helping me get to another level. Um, you know, um, I won with uh, Josh Briggs because that was, you know, full first, a uh, full, full, a uh, full circle moment. Um, you know, he was originally before going to Chaotic and stuff. He was, like, trained by uh, Mike Hollow and my, my trainer, Benny Jooks, uh, just a little bit. And then he really? went to Chaotic. Yeah. Like, they helped him when he first started. And then he went to Chaotic. And, like, it was kind of like, like, I when I was in there, I was wrestling Benny in my eyes. Like, it was like Benny did that for him, and then he did that for me. Like, he helped me out the same way that I feel like Benny. Like, it was just a full circle moment. Like, it, it, those, those are some of the matches that I really, you know, keep close to heart because they just mean so much to me. They Like, they show me why I'm in this business. Like, after the Eddie Edwards one, like, I don't mean to sound any, but I cried. Like, yeah, I was, I was so, like... It was just like ha I was just so happy that the match was like it was a great match and I got to do it and it was exactly how like I wanted it to go and like it was just like like this is why I do this shit that makes you know what I mean no that makes absolute sense and I mean uh, and and uh, Josh Alexander has actually been on this podcast um, but just to, you know the way that his mind works you know and oh, how amazing. how hard he's willing to work. Right, same thing with Eddie, Eddie Edwards, right? And so look at this. These are two guys who on an international stage, you know, were a parts of tag teams. You know, Eddie and Davy Richards as part of the American Wolves, you know, the North, Josh Alexander and Ethan Page, right? But have almost in in terms of like I don't want to say that they're, you know, they're uh their partners are maybe the, the Marty and that's not even a fair comparison because Marty Jannetty was a fabulous worker, you know? Yeah. Yes. He's got, you know, troubles that are pretty documented or whatever, but like, that's not a fair comparison, but like, you know, both Josh Alexander and Eddie Edwards are world champions. And that wasn't, you know, 10, five, 10, 15 years before mm -hmm. it wasn't vogue for a tag guy to be, you know, a, a world champion. I think, you know, Brett and Sean helped that, but there was there were so many that faltered because you're just a tag team guy. So for you to kind of be under that, you know, that learning tree and get that that bit of synergy with that, those two, I mean, 
Can it get any better? Well, it's going to get better, but but the, that's two big marks. Two big fucking Yeah, no, those two big two big matches. And I had them legit like Josh Alexander on Thursday, Eddie Edwards on Friday. How did your how did your body feel on Saturday? How oh, about I felt that? great. I felt great. You know what I mean? Like wrestling you callous over after a while. Like I got a muscle gun. I, I stretch, you know, like I work out, so I'll be fine. That's pretty. I mean, that, but that's that's the kind of key to longevity. And yeah, a lot of guys and girls of, of previous generations didn't do that. They felt like they had to be on, and that was the culture. You know, you couldn't go to Bill Watts or, or Vern Gagne and be like, oh, I'm going to do yoga or I'm going to do like acupuncture. They would have kicked you out of the damn territory, right? So, yeah. you know, so that that's one thing that was cool, uh, you know, and, you know, not stretch it up, but you know something that has been in the news this week is it's Tuesday, is you know Moxley going to rehab for alcohol. That's amazing that we've evolved to an extent where a guy can go to his boss and whatever and actually be heralded. Because how many wrestlers died of narcotics and alcoholism and yeah, just, no, it's you, uh, know? you know it's really you know good for him. You know that's that takes a lot. It's not easy um, for anybody. Like I'm, I'm not gonna sit here like I know from experience, but like I've known people that gone through that, and it's not easy. So you know, I'm very happy that he, you know, he did that, and it just it it takes a real man to realize, like, to step back and realize you have a problem. Yeah, um, it really does. Anybody can just drown their sorrows, and even when they're they know they have a problem. They continue to drown their sorrows. But a real man legit goes, all right, I need to address this now and be, you know, switch it up because this is not what I want to do. So, you know, hats off to him, bro. Uh, you know, I hope well for him and his family, even though I don't know the dude, you know. Yeah. I hope, you know, I hope you give, you, you know, everything goes good. And that, that's the thing. It's a, it's a brotherhood. It's a sisterhood, you know. Um, you, you know, all, all, it's it's a it's a weird one to kind of see, you know, kind of peripheral because like, I'm kind of involved in, you know, combat sports, but I, I kind of, you know, yeah. still have the peripheral vision of it. Right. And there's, you know, I can talk to somebody, you know, I'm talking to you right now. Right. And then to get you with Benny or to get you, you know, it's a different dynamic. It's a different conversation yeah. that workers have, you know, that, you know, and, and it should be guarded you know, theoretically speaking, but the, you know, once you've bled, you've sweat, you've traveled, you know, roads together and what have you, it's a different dynamic of, you know, of energy, of relationship that, you know, not even your moms, your dads, your significant other will, will know because again, they haven't been there. And th that's, that's no, you know, slouch on them or what have you. But like, so my favorite part of an MMA fight is like, when the final bell rings and every the coaches are slapping hands and hugging the opponents, or, you know, of the night or, you know, hugging and everything like that. Because if you can go 15 fucking minutes or 25 in a title fight with somebody and you literally see their soul, you might, you know, crack them, right? Crack them. And they keep coming back. You see that person's soul, yeah. right? So that's a part of, uh, you know, uh, and, a person's makeup that most people won't see. And if you can't be friends after that, then what the fuck are we all doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. No facts. <laughs> now I got to talk about your moveset, dude. Cause I think that's how I, you know, we were talking off air. That's how I discovered you. I was just like, and I went down a wormhole and that's usually what I do. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you're, the the two moves in your arsenal that uh, you know are somewhat your finish, right? They're your finishers, or they remind me of almost Arn Anderson's Gord Buster or Spine Buster. The first time I saw him, it's like no, you hit a motherfucker with one. That's all I need. Yeah. There's no false finishes or whatever. Those are things that you know you could theoretically do in the street and. That's usually the best finisher. That's why a full Nelson is amazing because you can put a motherfucker yeah, out. Yeah. You know, a rear naked a choke. Nelson, they don't know how to get out. This stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a wrap. You crack their collarbones and all that. Your shoulder blades are out of place. That's a finish, damn it. So how did you come up with this style? Um, I think it's just um, I just it's just me. Like I kind of took whatever I knew that I did differently in the ring, all the little things. 
um just like just made everything my like my stuff like I really don't have like a it's because most of my big moves are by accident anyways I all got them by like it wasn't even on I was supposed to do something else and end up turning into something else and look cooler you know like the 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 satellite headlock driver the prize possession was supposed to be you know he you know my my trainer had me up for a spinning rock bottom from power slam and he told me to do a TDT, but I wrapped around in, into a headlock driver. And he was like, hey, could you do that running? Or like my my flip DDT, like it was supposed to be a running blockbuster. And I went to hit Christian with it in the middle of a Christian Casanova or Camelo Hayes now um, in, a, in the middle of a match. And he held on and it turned into a flip DDT. And then the next match we had, he was like, hey, could you do, could we do that flip DDT? I'm like, oh, yeah, you mean actually do it this time? <laughs> like, but um, like actually go for it and um, or the kick you know, my finish, you know, the surprise kick. Yeah. Like that came by someone being like, Hey, I seen this move in a Tekken video game. Could you do it? And I cracked up and cracked it. And, you know, I, at first I didn't really do it right, but I kind of, you know, led into it. And now I made it my own. Just everything is kind of just like, this is the moves I like. And this is like, all right, my finish is a kick to the back of the head and a flip DDT. My, my, my kick to the back of the head is I can hit anyone with that. Mm-hmm. Any, it's, it's got the three A's, anyone, anywhere, anytime. Then I got my cool finish. I can hit on certain people or, you know, pull out an adult match. But most of my, like, I, I, the way I wrestle is focused on the way, like, where, like, where I'm, fo- like, where the story is. Like, if I'm working to me kicking you in the back of the head, I'm going to work your head, your, your back, your arms. Yes. I'm going to work that whole area to make sure that you're in pain. So when I crack you, you're done. So I think that's just, I just, and most of the time it's just me in there. Like I'm like how I would do, if I was in a street fight, it's yeah. how I'm going out there and fighting. Like I'm not going to, you know what I mean? I do cool wrestling moves, but most of the time if I was in a street fight, yeah, I'm going to pick you up and slam you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or, yeah, yeah. I'm going to kick you right in the face or I'm going to mm-hmm. knee you in the face or I'm going to get you down and try to kick you in the back. Like, yeah, like, so it's just, it's just all me in there. Well, you say happy accident, but the thing about it is, you've built your body in such a way and and your mindset, you know, that, you you know, all the training that you got, you're capable of doing such things, right? Because, you know, even, you know, one of the, the spot with uh, Ray Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero at Halloween Havoc, I think it was 96, 97, somewhere around there, you know, that was something that they couldn't do or, you know, Bret Hart and, and, and Mr. Perfect, you know, at SummerSlam, whatever it was at the garden, right? Mm-hmm. When they try to do it in WCW, it didn't work, Yeah, you know? So uh, you, you say it's a happy accident, but you've cultivated your temple, your, your body in, in such a way that you could perform such moves on a night-to-night basis. I mean, it's like that uh, aha take on me. In a day yeah. or two, right? That, that motherfucker has to hit that note in that 80s yeah. song every night, you know? Yeah. So, so the fact that you've gotten your body, like you said, calloused or what have you. Calloused just... means just, you know, taking bumps and everything. Even yeah. if the ropes hurt, you callous over from the pain. Like, it's not mm-hmm. that much. But I think it's it's mostly like, like you said, like, I've done my body like that because mm. I've played sports my whole life. i played every sport, you know, soccer, track, tennis, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, anything I can get my hands on, I did doesn't mean I was very good at most of them. I was good at some of them. You know, I felt like I was kind of like, I was, I was a good player. People wanted me on your team, but I wasn't an all-star. I wasn't a superstar. Like football aspect. My brother was the superstar, you know, football superstar of the family. Like I was really good at track. Um, You know, like I played bait, like I, you know, I was good at everything, but I would feel like I wasn't, those weren't my stuff. Yeah, and when I got and I you know I got in wrestling. I felt like this is what I am. Like th- I was put on this earth to be a wrestler. I wasn't put on this earth to be a baseball player or a soccer player or anything else. I was supposed to be a wrestler. Like this is my this is my passion. This is my calling. So I'm, I'm just glad that like I and it's crazy because I feel like all the sports I did, even though I wasn't like a superstar at them, they all got me to a point where it actually helped me become a better wrestler. Like doing high jump or hurdles got me more of the athletic and the jump. Right. Doing like football got me the toughness and or like mm-hmm. soccer got me the kicking skills. And, you know, I did karate. I got to like a yellow belt like that helped me with the kicks and, you know, all the in boxing and all, you know, all the MMA and all these different things that I did helped me become a better wrestler. You know, soccer and all of them like it, baseball, everything. 
like hand-eye coordination. You got to catch those balls. It's like yeah. someone throws a fist, I can catch the fist. Like, mm-hmm. like just I, like, yeah. So that's yeah. I'm just I'm happy that I've been able and to have the life that I've had so far and like been able to you know kind of like train myself. It's like Miyagi, like wax on, wax off. Mm-hmm. Daniel said they didn't know he was training, right? But he was actually training the whole time. Like that's how I feel like it's been. Like I didn't know I was training to be a wrestler my whole life but when it came down to it i went holy shit i'm supposed to be a wrestler mm-hmm. yeah and, and when those epiphanies happen which i was gonna ask you which you know you had to have some fringe benefits for all the athletic endeavors that you did pre-wrestling and it seemed like every bit it served you well which yeah. i mean in in life that's kind of it i remember my mom telling me like Oh, you know, I, I was mad because I, I had to take a regular job and, you know, my career hadn't popped the way I wanted it to. And she's like, hey, if, even if you work at McDonald's, right, if you do it right and, you you know, it's basically paying your bills, right, mm-hmm. you're saving a, lot, a little bit of extra, you know, to get to where you want to be, mm-hmm. right? then McDonald's is what led you to where you want to end up, right? Yeah. Every little bit of it. And, and you know, and that's kind of the thing with like the social medias and everything like that, where you know people see the cool pictures and the moves and the you know when when everything is good, but not really understand what went into it. It's yeah. it, you know it takes a lifetime, a lifetime to become an overnight success. Facts, no, it really does. And like, no, I wasn't like that. I mean, like, I'm not gonna sit here and be like I was shitty at sports. I mean, like, right. don't get me wrong, I'm gonna just do that because you know I was you know. <laughs> You know, gold medalist track winner, high jump and hurdles, both indoor and outdoor. You know, city champion in football, city champion in baseball, mayor's cup winner in freaking tennis, or so, second yeah. in tennis, uh, baseball, you know, soccer, you know, city champ. So I wasn't like I was, you know, some Joe Schmo, but I wasn't yeah. a superstar. I just was a team player. But like, you you know, like you just said, like, that's all correct. It's You know what I mean? It's 100%. Like, I like it. Now, in terms of, you know, your career going forward, are there any, like, do you have a dream match or, you know, and I, I kind of, it's not just like the person, like if the Price City OG picked a venue mm-hmm. and an era where this happens, because sometimes, you know, I, I hear that a lot, you know, like this person was, you know, if they were in the seventies, they'd be a big star yeah. or what have you. So like, let's, let's have the, person it could be any form of match right it could be death match it could be tag it could be wherever it, it's wherever. easy bro it's gonna be i want uh i want a one-on-one and it's gonna be with ricky the dragon steamboat because it's fucking the dragon bro like yes so long. he's one of the greatest wrestlers of all time Yes, no, hundred percent. I mean, his entire career, he stayed face. Who does yep. that without turning? It, it, Ricky the Dragon Steve. Yes. Brother. Oh, and I mean, even he would watch boxing matches to see how they fell mm-hmm. to add, you know, a, a a bit more realism to whatever he was doing, you know. And is uh, speaking of Massachusetts, I mean, he got his head cracked in by the DDT yeah. at the old Boston Gardens. Exactly. You know? Like so. Dude. Give me the old Boston Garden. Give me Ricky the Dragon Steamboat main event. Let's do it. Oh, that's, that's my dream match. Oh, I got goosebumps, bro. Like I want to see as a fan. I want to see that. But I mean, and and that also speaks to your upbringing and kind of where your ideology is. Yes, you like it, a good pro wrestler should be able to do it all, yeah. right? Strong 100%. style lucha. Japanese, you know, pursue American style, and most to the untrained eye, they're all the same things, right? But right. lucha is a different style. You yeah, know, you're so you're doing right. you you're working the opposite end, you know, and you're doing a lot of roles because the rings in Mexico are fucking cement, man. You don't want to yeah, do or they're fucking or or they're or they're boxing rings, right? Yeah, like I'm not throwing shade, but like there's a reason why lucha style is different. I, but like that's what my trainer always said. My trainer always told me that you know the best wrestler can work any style to make anybody look good you make yourself look good but you make the other person look like a million bucks he was like you always like and i'm not being like lebron james like 
oh, you got to be the greatest of all time. And he's like, but sometimes you have to LeBron, you have to be LeBron James. He was like, you have to have a banger of a match. You have to look good, but you have to make your opponent look 10 times better than they are. Even though this, I face a lot of people that are great, but I'm going to go in there and make you look like you're WrestleMania ready. You know what I mean? Like, that's my goal. So it's like, like you said, like, you got to make everybody look good. Like, and that's like, yep, just make everybody look good. You got a LeBron James, that shit. Like, I want to work every style. I Like, I feel like I'm, I'm capable of working anybody. I feel like I can work anybody of any style or skill level. Like, not, you know, not because I'm like, say, but I, I, re- I honestly believe that. I have been put in the ring with people that have different styles than me. And we've had class, but we've had bangers like me and Beef. Beef's not my style. You know, Kevin Koo isn't my style. Or like Slade last night. You know, I'm, I'm, I, Slade's not my style of wrestling, but me and Slade had a banger. You know, even though I got that dub. You know what I mean? Yay! But, yeah, it's just, I, I want to, I, I feel like I can work anybody. So uh, that's, I, I take pride in being able to work anybody and everybody. But that's it, you know, and, and taking passion for your craft, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a perpetual, like, if you're an artist, right, and you paint a picture, like, but you also need money, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Right? Like, you're like, oh, okay. I mean, is it worth 20 bucks? Is it worth 200? Is it worth 2,000? You know, because yes, it's your baby and you know what it means to you and what it basically took out of you to create this this piece of art, right? Mm-hmm. But you also need your, your needs met. So I don't think that's, I, I don't think that they should be separated because, you know, um, somebody posted on social media where like, oh, I wish like, you know, wrestlers didn't have to charge for, for merch or, or pictures. And I was just like, and I, I just kind of watched the discourse, right? Yeah. Because I'm all like, if the person is paying, you know, to have these made one, they are, yes, you get a booking fee, but sometimes the booking fee doesn't even cover travel. Right. No, we're paying for that stuff. Like it's it's like it's not like we're we're doing it to be dicks and like ha 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 like if someone wants to take a picture with you, there should be no charge on taking a picture with you. Right. But if you want like like a promo pick that I have here on the table or a t shirt, like this is how I make my living and make my business and like get my brand out. It's not any disrespect to the fans, it's just like right. this is how we, we make money. Like, yeah, we get we get a we get a fee for working the show, like we get paid for working the shows, but it's not it's not that much, and that's why wrestlers bring they get, like their their merch and all that, not only to represent their brand and themselves, but also you know get their business. Like they're not trying to. It's not it's not just about wrestling at the end. Like it's about business to some people. Some people are about that. Like they this is their this is their livelihood. So I don't like I don't I don't see that. Like well, why do you know what I mean? Like people do like, no, it's not. Oh, why do people do that? It's like, we do this for a reason. If you were going to go to a rap concert and a rapper has merch, you're going to tell them like, they should be giving me your merch. Like, no, you go to a rap concert and go to like, let me get, let me get merch for free. They're going to tell you like, go fuck off. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what, what are you doing here? You know, kick rock. Yeah. No, I, I, I love it. But again, that's, you know, different ideologies behind the, you know, if the concept is, is what you do, you know, between the square, you know, between the ropes of the squared circle, or a cage, or a boxing ring, mm-hmm. or what have you. You know, there's different ways that people approach this concept, right? And yeah. some are pro, some are con, but that's what makes it amazing. Like the, the inclusion of everything. Everybody is allowed to, you know, par- parlay their passions, mm-hmm. but you know your role. Yeah, like, and it's not even anything about like. They take that time when wrestlers are at merch table to come up, like buy their merch, show the support. Like it's, you know what I mean? Like show why they're your favorite wrestler. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have it, that's fine. But like, that's the time to come and say hi to your, like your, your favorite wrestler, like get a picture with them, like see what's up. Like, you know, yeah. create a lasting memory. Like we're there for that too. Like we want to make sure that the fans are fans and they're taken care of and everything. No, 100%. And that's one thing that you do well, which I've linked all your socials in the description of this very podcast. I mean, the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook business page, as well as the Pro Wrestling Tees. But before we get to all of that, obviously, mm-hmm. there have been a lot of people, Alec, that have contributed 
to your success, you know, it, just your life, both professionally and personally. So uh, take as long as you need, my man. Let's get some shout out, uh, shout outs out of the way. Um, you know, just shout out to everyone that's ever given me an opportunity. Um, that's ever like, you know, helped me or given me like knowledge. Um, I'm not going to like, cause I don't want to leave anybody out. Cause there's a lot of people that have, you know, helped me be, you know, get better in wrestling and I take from everybody, but I want to make sure that like, you know, people that know that's helped me out. I just want this, like, this is for you. Like, thank you. Thank you for helping me get better. Thank you for giving me the critique to improve myself. Every time I step in that ring, thank you for, you know, checking me on. a fuck about making me get better and like seeing you know what i mean like just thank yeah. you for everyone that's ever given me an opportunity and like helped me like i really appreciate everyone and everyone i will remember like anybody that's helped me out if i ever when i make it big not not i'm not gonna do whenever i make it big it's when i make it big like i will remember that and i will always be you know grateful for that because it's about the people that help you out it's not just about you because a lot of people can't do anything by themselves like i can i can mm wrestle and go to a certain point by myself but without the people that are there to help me get better then i wouldn't be anything no i and i, I love that you have that perspective you know because uh there are some that are just like ah again look at me well like i did it yeah i like, did it I look did what i did myself and it's like come on you're telling me no one gave you an opportunity mm -hmm. like no one no one put you on that stage or no one let you go in the ring or help out or go show up to a show or anything like that like yeah yeah, it's it's weird, but again, that's the the, the pro and con of you know different people approaching different mindsets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and we need them all, you know, because you sample this, you take some yeah. of there, you, you give need the this haters to make you want to work. You, you need the haters, you need the people that just don't get it, and you need the people that understand. No, hundred percent. Now, for people to get more acquainted with the Prize City OG, and again, like I said, everything is in the description, so you don't have to look far. But uh, just shout it out. Uh, where can they find you on the interwebs? All right. So, if you're watching this podcast, it's either because you really like this podcast, which makes sense because you know Woods is awesome. You know, great podcast host, or it's because you like my face, this ugly mug right here. So, if you want to follow me. Go do it right now. I don't know why you haven't already done it. It's the Prize City OG on Insta and Twitter. Same handle. You can go to my Facebook. My Facebook page is the Prize, the Prize Alec Price. My Facebook account is the uh, Alec Price. I may or may not accept your friend request. And Snapchat's only for the woes. Also, my pro wrestling tees are up, so go buy. I got a new shirt out. It's fire. It's, you know, Pokemon Pokedex designed, and it's got my skull and my tongue. Like, why can't you not? Stop being a fool. Don't be a buster. Follow me. Follow this podcast. Continue to support pro wrestling. Hell yes. And thank you for your support, Alec Price. I can't wait to see what is uh, in the works with you. Uh, let's uh, try and get you some West Coast booking so uh, you can see, you know, yeah. here in this, this, this city of uh, sunshine and glitz and glamour. Like, we, we need you here. I need, we need some you. sun. <laughs> yes. So, and uh, thank you guys for joining us here at According to Woods. And uh, just like Alex said, hey, if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, I don't know why you you don't. But guess what? We can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. I mean, Alex, you're subscribed to the podcast, aren't you? Yeah, I'm subscribed. Why? Like, why? I wouldn't be on a podcast if I ain't gonna be subscribed to it. See. I like his ideology. You will too. So go ahead and follow him. Go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. If you don't believe me, you don't believe the Pride City OG. Well, here's Zeta Zang to help convince you. Hey, this is Zeta Zang. Make sure you subscribe.